My name is Ainelek Wilmot. I am a Jamaican surfer, also a musician, songwriter, guitar player. <laughs> My name is Aika Wilmot and I am a surfer, surf instructor, musician. Sometimes I do a little bit of acting too. My name is Ellis Sharma Beckford, Sharma the Superman on Instagram. My name is Iva Wilmot. I'm 17 years old. Iva the Great on Instagram. My name is Ronley Lewis. Surf is always a passion for me. My name is Garen Price. I'm 19 years old. I'm a surf instructor. I like to dance and I do surfing. Surfing in Jamaica actually started with fishermen, from my perspective. When I was a youngster growing up here on the beach in the 60s, you had about half a dozen boats, because this was a legitimate fishing beach at the time. And boats went out regularly. This is back before most of the boatmen had motors for their, for their craft. They would just use the oars and paddles. And being the fact that this side of the island is so rough and we have so many rough days, many times the fishermen would have to go out. Sometimes they would, most of them were setting fish traps, fish pots, and when the sea gets rough, sometimes they can leave them, but sometimes if the sea is getting really rough, they have to go and bring them in or they'll get damaged in the reefs by the waves. And when the fishermen were coming in, Waves come in sets, waves don't just break constantly. Waves, you'll have some big ones come in, then you'll have a, a few minutes, a 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes when they're smaller, and then here comes another four or five big ones again, and then another period of calm. So the fishermen, when they were coming in, because of the nature of this beach, pushing up their boats on the beach, there was a timing involved where you had to be able to get in and be at the edge of the beach when there were no big waves coming so you could actually push the boat up on the beach out of the reach of the big waves so when the big waves came so you had some very skillful fishermen who would anticipate the waves and when the big ones were coming they would position themselves just outside of the breaking waves and then as the last big wave would come in they would paddle and actually catch the wave and surf the wave in with their boats and then get to the beach and that would be the last wave of the big waves so that would be like the most skillful fishermen and everybody would say wow look at that and us as kids we would swim by the boats as he was waiting for the right wave we would swim beside the boat and hold on to the back of the boat so when he caught the waves the boat would toss him so we got the idea of catching the wave and we would swim out here as kids and swim and catch the waves and body surf and then after a while those old canoes that the people used to build out of the cottonwood trees they would we would go to the old ones that were maybe rotted out and were derelict and pushed up on the beach and we'd take a machete and cut a small piece of wood maybe 15 inches wide by about two and a half feet long and we would lie on that on our bellies and catch the waves so that's really where we started our surfing surfing began there for me personally you know but over in boston bay in port antonio portland and port antonio was one of the first major tourist locations in the eastern end of the island it was very popular amongst the more well-to-do um, visitors to our island as you know many movie stars have properties in portland and errol flynn and properties over there and so it was very popular Blue Lagoon and had many attractions and Boston Bay became a very popular beach because of its scenic beauty but it also provided waves that were surfable and 
the manner in which the waves broke, they broke on the outside, went over the reef, and then died on the inside. So no matter how rough the sea got, there was inside area for swimming. So people would always go there to swim, and tourists got there, and eventually one of these tourists who was able to surf recognized that these were good surfing waves. And eventually someone arrived with a surfboard over there in the early 60s and started surfing. On the south coast, you had local guys who got into surfing, local guys from Kingston, learned about surfing. One of them brought a surfboard from the States and the other surfers got old refrigerator foam out of the old re refrigerator and got old fiberglass drapery and bought resin, boat resin from the boat yard and constructed their own surfboards using that uh, real surfboard as a model. And surfing began on the south coast. And then I started seeing these surfers coming to the beach and surfing here. This wasn't their main surfing beach. They surfed at other beaches, but because this was a popular beach, when they were finished surfing, they'd come here and hang out, drink a beer, that sort of thing. And if the waves were really big, they would probably paddle out and get some small ones here. Because when it was really big, we get some small, with nice waves coming in here. And they would surf here. And I was witness to that. And eventually one of them ended up lending me a board. And when they were leaving. One of them was actually in college in the States and he came down for the summer and camping on the beach with the surfboards and when he went back he sold me one and that's basically how I started. That was my first surfboard of my own and that was probably about 1974 or so. So, but, but interestingly, um, there is a, an old hotel downtown called the Myrtle Bank. It's no longer there. It's right on the waterfront next to the, to the bank downtown, Central Bank downtown, where you know all that remains is a line of royal palm trees going down the, towards the, the, the sea, towards the harbor. And that used to be one of the most prestigious um, hotels in Kingston. And I have an old Jamaica tourist guide that was put out by the Ministry of Tourism and probably one of the first ones they put out and it mentions that um, Myrtle Bank Hotel provided a, a launch that would take people across the harbour to go out to the Palisades to go surf bathing and in those days surf bathing was referring to interacting with the waves whether on surfboards or body surfing or body boarding. So that was the earliest mention, and that book was published in 1912. So we have a very long history, if you want to look at it in, in terms of that. We have a very long history of surfing. So generally, we can put a date out of, say, 1911, 1910, maybe, when first interaction with the surf was recorded and noted. Um, and for myself, I would say the late 60s, and my first surfboard, 1974. I started surfing at around age 7 I think and then I started surfing seriously at about age 9 is when I started surfing a lot. I started surfing way back when I was probably about 6. I don't remember exactly when I started but I just know that me and my brothers all started around the same time when one brother was about seven, I was about six, my other brother was about eight. So it's somewhere around that time. And been hooked and surfing ever since. I've been surfing for 11 years, since I was six, 17 now. Um, really been surfing seriously for the past six or so years. And, you know, traveling and surfing with these guys you know, for a very long time. Tell you the truth, I don't really remember when I started surfing, but people have told me that two and a half and four years old from different people. But I really remember surfing like seriously at maybe 10. I'm 17 now, so seven years ago. I started surfing when I was at least 16. I've been surfing for like 10 years now, from I was nine. I met Sharma on the beach surfing one day and he introduced me to surfing 
Shama and his sister. So I start to surf from there and then I meet the Wilmot family and that was it. Surfing is a very addictive sport, so when we, when we started to surf, or when I started to surf, um, we used to do a lot of other extracurricular activities. We used to do swimming, um, we used to do taekwondo, you know, football, that kind of stuff. Um, when we started surfing, we basically stopped doing everything else, and we tried to surf as much as we could. We surfed, like, at least as much as during school time we surf like 14 times a week um, that's twice a day during the summer like 28 times a week you know four times per day and it's a very addictive sport so you know it, it kind of takes over your life in an kind of obsessive kind of way yeah. um, I used to be involved in lots of other sports I played cricket I was a competitive swimmer, I swam for YMCA, speedos, um, I was very much into table tennis as well and when I started surfing I just virtually lost all interest in every other sport, I just wanted to surf, nothing could hold a candle to the sport of surfing where I was concerned in terms of what a sport gave you as a youngster growing up. And, but it was a very lonely sport at the time because there were so few of us doing it. There wasn't a community of surfers. It was me and one friend from Copacabana surfing here regularly, you know, and there, on the island there may have been less than 20 surfers at the time. So it was a very lonely sport. And when I grew up and then started having kids of my own and taught them to surf and saw how much they were getting into sports and they used to do Taekwondo and other sporting activities and I realized that now on Saturday they had to go to Taekwondo and the waves were really good on Saturday and they were like, I don't want to go, I want to go surf and you know, and I could identify with that sentiment and I said, why are we sending them to Taekwondo and it's mainly because all children benefit from organized sporting activity, you know, it's not just about the enjoyment they receive. It's the camaraderie, it's learning to deal with competitive aspect of sports, you know. It's learning about training and the importance of, of how you build your career if you take it seriously, you know, your, your physical abilities and analyzing your performances and that sort of thing. Wherein if you're just surfing for fun, you don't think about that sort of thing. So I realized that we needed some kind of organization in the sport. And I said, what we would have to do is form an association that could have regular events, that could have a national series, that could declare a national junior or open or women's champion every year and, and have kids trying their best to really, you know, attain their utmost in the sport and have records that people can go back and a history that is documented so you can say who was the national champion in 2002 and it would be recorded and there was somewhere you could find that out and kids would have something to strive for. So it was really out of the, the recognition that my kids being involved in surfing, I didn't want them to just be involved in a surf that was going to turn out the proverbial beach bum then. You know, I wanted them to go through surfing and at the end of it, be able to have some kind of career if they so chose to do, you know. And I look into the international community of surfing and realize how many job options there are in, in, in the sport of surfing. It's just, just whether you're the best surfer and you can win a competition. You know, there are coaches, there are judges, there are contest organizers, there are people who run surf shops, there are surfboard manufacturers, and all the aspects of surfboard manufacturing from the, from the creation of the board and the shaping of the board. When a surfboard is made, usually at least three people are involved 
in the manufacture of the board, the, the shaper and the laminator and the person who puts in the hardware on the boards and that sort of thing. We have people, graphic artists who made the designs on the boards. There's clothing that's affiliated with surfing, surf brands, you know, in clothing. There's jewelry, there's slippers, there's sunglasses, there's hats. There's all sorts of products associated with the thing. And I realized that this is a very huge industry. So I said, let's form the association. Let's have a voice for surfers in Jamaica. Let's be able to approach the government and say these are some of the things that need to be in place in order to support surfing in Jamaica. And as a result, we have the Jamaica Surfing Association. I grew up and back when you're younger and you're learning how to surf, your dream is to be, to do what you love to do for a living. And when we, from I was, let's say when I was six years old, surfing was what we did. Before we started surfing, we used to do a whole other bunch of stuff, but then once you start surfing, everything just kind of get put to the side and you just surf only. And from then it's like, this, if I could do this for a living, I could just surf and just have fun for a living that would be my dream job so from ever since I wanted to like do it but it never really seemed feasible until when I was like I finished high school and was and I went to university and it's like like on in, in like I think my second or third year in university I, I was skateboarding and I fell and I broke my femur broke my leg and it's like I was couldn't walk for like four months you know, and was that to be like in bed, sitting around, can't do anything at all. And it's like, that's when I made up my mind. I was like, even if I'm going to starve, I'm going to do what I love doing for the rest of my life or for as long as I can do it. So that's when I really made up my mind to start saying, I'm just going to just surf and just do that. And then like the next year, I just kind of went up to the surf trade show that they have in Florida. And I pretty much just, spoke with a bunch of companies, got some of them interested in working with me and I just kind of took it from there. So as soon as I graduated, I just hit the road and started traveling and surfing, competing and everything. Well, I've had thoughts about being a professional surfer and it's definitely an option. But, you know, I'm trying to keep my options open at this point, you know, trying a bit of everything just to see what really meshes with my character. Professional surfing is something that I did consider, but I don't really do that well in contests. So I would like to just travel and take like pictures, travel with photographers and different surfers. Hopefully get it published in magazines and then the sponsors will give you money for having their sponsor's sticker on your board in a magazine. So hopefully I'll get money from that when I do get out there in the surfing world. Well, actually, if, if I could take surfing to a next level, it would actually be like probably getting a couple sponsors, you know, go do some contests in different Caribbeans. I'd go there and compete, probably do some photo shoot. I would never know, you know, stuff like that. And I would be all good because doing something I love, I could put in all the effort I need to put in and stay right there and be on top. I would like to reach very far in surfing, but I'm just doing what I can do now and anywhere it extends, I'll definitely be there as well to represent as Jamaica surf the same way. The Maka Pro contest, of course, was another was another um, stage of the development. You know, we started with local events until we got to the point where we said we need a, we were looking at the benefits that we had achieved from local events. At the time, my kids were at the top of the ladder in terms of the surfing performances, and they got a lot of exposure and recognition as being the top performers in surfing. But um, I realized that being Jamaica's champion, when you look at it on, on a worldwide level and this international surfing community being a Jamaica's champion means nothing you know that's not like being Hawaii champion you know or Australian champion you know being Jamaican champion that doesn't say 
anything for your career. Nobody knows what surfing in Jamaica is, what is what being a champion means, what is the standard of surfing in Jamaica. You know, if, even if you're an excellent surfer, you know what I mean? It's very difficult to come and not have that background surfing in somewhere. That's why you hear Ika will say he needs to go abroad to compete, to stay current, so people hear his name. Winning in Jamaica is not going to keep his name current in the surf community abroad. You know, he's going to have to win a contest or place in the semifinals or quarterfinals or, you know, go through 10 heats in an event in order to be recognized as a really good surfer. So I was looking at it and say, how can we improve the standing of our local surfers and I said you know if we had an international event here that could attract international surfers and if we could have that event associated with other Caribbean events and if we could create a tour in the Caribbean for the professional surfers so that at the end of the year we could declare a Caribbean champion this would mean a lot more in the, in the world, you know, you're the Barbados champion and you're the Caribbean champion, you're the Jamaican champion and you're the Caribbean champion, you know what I mean? It would give them another level up in terms of the tiers that they, they, they could ascend towards more recognition. So that was the basic concept behind why we would want to develop a professional event in Jamaica. So that's where the idea was really coming from. Well, normally I compete in the local contest, but we don't have that much as we used to. So I compete in like Maca Pro and I passed one heat and the next one I kind of got nervous, but I dropped out. I didn't really feel bad. I was actually happy to compete to show people that there are surfers and we love it, even though we win or lose, you know. So yeah, it was pretty fun for me as well. I competed in the mock-up where I came. Last year I was the champion for junior, and this year I came second in the juniors and third in the open. Because it was the wave selection, and didn't get the better wave out there in the water, and Sharma didn't get the better wave, so he won over me. This year has really been one of those years that I've been working really hard. You know, I've been training a lot in my backyard because I have waves right behind my house. You know, like every evening after school, try to make time for surfing. So I get a lot of sessions in. The local, the national events, managed to got, get first place in the Opens and the Juniors as well, nationally. So that was, you know, a good start to the year. And then finishing off with Maca Pro. So I'm feeling very good about that um, with my performances leading up to now. Jamnesia is our family-run little business here. We teach surfing. In the summer, we run a little surf camp for kids, and we also do a little music, a live music thing we do here every other Saturday. This surfing school that we, that basically I head the, the charge on the surfing school and teaching surfing. It's something I do when I'm not competing, I usually just teach because I love surfing so much and when you teach someone how to surf and they stand up on the board for the first time and you see the joy and the excitement that they get, it just brings back the whole love that you have for the sport that much more. And so that's why when I'm not competing, I'm not traveling, I'm, always, I'm either here teaching or I actually teach also for a couple months in the Virgin Islands in the winter time. So I do a couple months there, I do a couple months here and then I travel for the rest of the year and just surf and compete. We started teaching from years ago because in our area there's not that much things to do you know and it's like we grew up and seeing kids around us growing up and kind of getting into the wrong crowd and stuff where we had surfing to kind of keep us and they didn't you know so they kind of went off into a different tangent and some of them got mixed up in other stuff and kind of messed up lives and stuff where because we were surfing we're kind of focused more on surfing we were a lot more conscious of oh let's not go out on the road and let's not go do that and let's just sit here 
keep fit, keep active. When there are waves, we'll go surfing. And when there are not waves, we're fixing our surfboards or you know, trying to train to get better so that when the waves do come back, we'll be even better than we were last time. You know, So with that whole aspect of surfing where it kind of saved our lives and kept us in the right path, we started teaching kids how to surf and you know surfing is as i said it's really good it's really healthy sport it keeps you fit keeps you aware of the environment and that's kind of what we need here nowadays because a lot of people don't realize the impact that man has on the environment because i mean we go to the beach and we surf every day and going to the beach every single day there's thousands of plastic bottles on the beach and even if we clean up we clean up and we get 20 odd garbage bags load of plastic off the beach and in another month it's full again you know and surfing keeps you aware of that stuff so apart from it being really fun and it keeps you really fit and healthy it gets you more in tune with the environment and that's kind of as a surfer you start to see that and start to get into that To be a part of surfing in Jamaica, it's kind of new to most Jamaicans and over the past couple of years surfing, Jamaican surfing has been seen globally, you know, as Jamaica has been seen as a surf destination globally over the past couple of years, you know, so we've been, you know, getting some recognition where surfing is concerned and we have some of the best surfers, you know, this high quality surfing, so it's, it's good. As far as surfing waves are concerned, Jamaica is up there, like, in the world, like, really good waves. We get waves here throughout the whole year, whereas most of the more popular destinations for surfing, they get waves for, like, just the winter season or a few waves in, in the summer or the best time is, like, between July and November and then the rest of the year it's, like, really small. Where here, we have waves all year. Pretty much you can come to the beach almost any day of the year and you'll at least have a wave, like, three, four feet, which is good enough to surf on, you know, good enough to have some nice fun on. And the quality of waves is really good. We have a lot of really, like, world-class waves out here. Um, we've kind of lost one of our best waves in Hurricane Ivan way back, like, 10 years ago, I think. And that wave was like, hands down, the best wave I've, one of the best waves I've ever surfed. Um, but we have, we still have a whole lot of really good spots and the, the different types of wave, the variety we have here is really good. We have waves for learners, we have waves for advanced surfers, we have, you know, everything you might want. And it's really consistent. That's the, that's the best part about it. So as I said, you can go surf whenever you want to surf. As, a part, as opposed to surfing for four months out of the year and then sitting down and waiting for surf the rest of the year. So that's the benefit of surfing here. Well, in five years, Ivor the Great will probably be a legend, you know, in Jamaican surfing in the history books as one of the icons or uh, maybe not but you know can always shoot for the stars maybe i'll be you know one of the world's better like known surfers you know from jamaica rasta kid but who knows possibilities are endless but i don't really sure about the contest maybe by then i get good in contests and then i start beating everybody and you'll hear about me from like the top surfer from the caribbean or whatever you know i for the next couple of years, that's my plan. Like, I surf, I compete, I travel, and just try to do as best I can in competition and run this little road and see how long I can keep doing it. And then, after a while, I've been teaching surfing, as I said, which is slowly starting to look a bit more feasible for me. And so, when I kind of retire off competing or competing full time, I can do more teaching and get more kids involved because, you know, the more kids we have involved in surfing, the bigger the sport's going to get and then the more support the sport's going to get locally. So, say, if someone wants to take surfing as a profession the way I did, 
I had to go outside of Jamaica and get support from com companies in the States and that kind of stuff to get to help support me for my competing and traveling and doing my stuff. Whereas someone in Jamaica, in maybe in another couple of years, the companies here will start to realize that, hey, surfing is feasible. We can market this really well and it's we have better waves than a lot of other places in the world. We have more consistent waves than many places like Jamaica gets more consistent and bigger and better waves most of the time than even California, you know? And California is like the Mecca for surfing and we have better waves than them, you know? So the more people start to realize that and kind of put more support into the sport, then being a surfer, a professional surfer in Jamaica or from Jamaica doing it worldwide would be more feasible. So for me, I've just been kind of doing it like hand to mouth kind of thing, just kind of ban my belly and do what I love doing because I love doing it, you know? But it's slowly growing and maybe maybe a little more support next couple of years, it, it will get where it's going. Jamaica having so much surf around the Eastern seaboard. We should take advantage of this because our Eastern seaboard is virtually undeveloped. All our surfing potential has been maximized or has been taken advantage of in the western end of the island. Montego Bay, Ocho Rios, Negril, Falmouth, all those places are developing a tourism product. To think of developing a tourism product in the eastern end of the island, especially a parish like say St. Thomas, where there is virtually nothing in terms of infrastructure to support a tourism industry. There is not the infrastructure. So it, thinking of what do you do for a parish like Portland? Well, surf tourism is a perfect thing because surf tourists, unlike other tourists that we cater to, are not coming here and want to have an all-inclusive thing that they pay 1500 per person and they get a week with everything included and they just hang out on the beach, drink at the bar. That's not a surfer's vacation. A surfer wants to ride waves. And waves are not created in a pool where you turn the thing on and you pay $10 to ride a wave. You have to wait for the ocean and nature to create the waves and present them to you. So when you're traveling to a country, your best bet is to maximize your, up, your, your potential for scoring, as surfers call it, scoring, meaning being there when the waves are there. So you want to be able to spend an extended amount of time in the environment, on the island, at the location where the sea waves are, you know. So surfers who, tourists who travel for surf, tend to spend a long time in their, their, their average trip lengths are over 10 days, all the while, not weekend trips, they don't do that sort of thing. They want to stay, they want to eat locally, they want to interact locally, they want to um, stay in hostels, they want to bring their tent and camp in the back of somebody's yard who lives close to the surf. Um, they want to share dinner with the family where they're staying with, develop a relationship, come back year after year after year, bring their friends. And we've seen where this has developed in many countries around the world and, and added, bolstered their economies greatly, you know what I mean? Like take for example Peru, who has nationalized all their coastline now and so private enterprise cannot own their coastline it's not anywhere around where waves are breaking. We should do something like that in Jamaica to secure our surf breaks so nobody can just buy the land adjacent to it and then have a monopoly on it. So stuff like that needs to be done. But when you see what other countries have done, their Peru's um, tourism contribution from surfing went from 0.5 to 14% of their, their, their tourism income. In, in the space of about four years, just because they put effort into it, you know what I mean? And it wasn't because they built sky-rise hotels along the coast. All they did was support local people to fix the place, they fixed the roads, they made sure water supply was good in the area, you know, there was electricity, there was a bus running through these places, you know, they encouraged local people, taxi owners to get their thing registered and that sort of thing, and they encouraged people to make stalls where surfers could get food after they were finished surfing, you know, hang out, little bars, little, little hostels along the beach front. And that would be perfect for our end of the island where we don't have a lot of infrastructure and we don't have a lot of capital to invest in major infrastructure.
Hello, my name is Aishak Wilmot. I am the eldest brother or the eldest Wilmot boy. One of the best experiences in surfing for me was this one time I almost drowned, but I didn't drown, so that was pretty cool. Expecting them to take it further because they're better than me when I was at their age, so hopefully they will rep it hard and, you know, up there with Jamaica name, same way.